Yeah. Hello. Hello, hello. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. Is it Michael? Yes, I'm Michael. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. So uh, we are now live. Um, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Michael. Um, and he'll be talking to us about union types. Um, so please, without further ado, go ahead. Thank you. So uh, union types uh, are uh, very popular for typing dynamic uh, languages. Uh, they are a kind of dual of intersection types. That is, uh, instead of intersection, you just use unions of all possible options. Uh, here we will talk about uh, JSON, which is JavaScript object notation. It is a data format originally used uh, for JavaScript uh, to communicate between backend and frontend, and now universally used uh, to communicate between uh, backends in different languages and APIs. Uh, I will present the type like framework that can be used to uh, have a modular way of checking uh, correctness of the union type system, but maybe also uh, dual type systems like unification based type systems or the uh, intersection type systems. And I will give an example of implementation in Haskell. Uh, so a short example of JavaScript object notation, uh, it contains a uh, few types of objects, in particular dictionaries with uh, named keys that are used to distinguish fields. These dictionaries can be used as a records as here or as mappings from, uh, from keys to values. It's ambiguous. Then we have lists that uh, use the common list syntax with comma separation, uh, strings and numbers that can uh, represent either integers of arbitrary uh, size and floating points. The rules for representation are actually quite complicated and ambiguous. Also, there are uh, null values, uh, booleans. So we represent this in a strongly typed language like a Haskell with a value that can be either object which is mapping from strings to values, array, a null, number, which requires special representation that takes care of representing both accuracy and the uh, mantissa, a string or boolean. You see that uh, here in this representation, null values have a special type of their own because they can appear in any other type. Uh, here we uh, also mentioned that there is uh, other work on typing uh, JSON uh, values with a mark of chains, that is quick type. Uh, there is similar work on F sharp type providers uh, that try to provide uh, the types just from connection to database or from a JSON schema. And there is also another uh, type system framework for union types that is Castania's uh, set-based framework. And uh, similar to it uh, is used to in XDUS XML uh, transformation language. The key features of traditional uh, unification-based type system are decidability, soundness, subject reduction, relational versus algorithmic formulation, because algorithmic formulation allows us to reason about complexity and is ultimately needed to implement a practical programming language. Uh, key features of the frameworks are usually uh, extensibility and ability to cross the languages within the framework so that we can use the same type framework to reason about JSON types, for example, and Haskell types and transformation between these two languages, because representation will be different. And I will give you a few examples from the 
actual uh, JSON APIs, how this JSON uh, JavaScript object notation is used, and why does it require union types. So, for example, API argument is an image. That basically means that we have a string value, a subset of valid string values that can be used. Another example is page size determines the number of results to return, like from 10 to 10,000. So that would be a subset of integer values between 10 and 10,000. A date field contains ISO 8601 date, which means also the string value that actually conforms to a certain format. And that we would like to represent by uh, basically a new type or, or data type that is is from some email library that our, uh, allows us to pass email into server part and a uh, login part. And for each of these, sometimes we don't really have the type description because we don't have a JSON schema, but only examples from a API description on the HTML page. This is example for page size that is 100 or absent, right? In this case, we would like to represent it as a page size that may be present as integer or absent. Uh, similar, we may have a source of answers from the API that conform to certain format, but no explicit representation and we want to infer from these examples what is actual a uh, type that we can check and it's likely to conform to it instead of parsing arbitrary json value because of course if we uh, think parsing arbitrary json value we will start making implicit assumption of what is inside or we are unable to to require anything of the value so we don't really know what is the information constant inside. So in case of alternative objects, we would use native uh, programming language uh, representation for uh, types that may be tagged unions. In this case, uh, that's either representation, that is either string or int, which uh, with slightly different uh, type operator. But soon we stumble upon uh, ambiguities here. So we have here uh, an array of arrays, but these arrays are not really lists of uh, the same values. The arrays inside are rows in the relation. And that's a very common representation. And we would like to represent it as a list of values that have the same uh, representation for each row and the same type for each row. Otherwise, we are unable to process this as a relation. That means that we have ambiguity about what should be the inferred type in this case, right? Should it be a list of lists of unions of either int, string, null, or date? Or should it be a, a list of examples? Another example would be uh, the mapping from a hexadecimal value to a description of the block on the blockchain. In which case, we actually have a mapping from any hexadecimal value to a standard object. Using uh, one default representation that always thinks that a uh, dictionary should be a record will give us rather incomprehensible and uh, likely faulty representation where each hexadecimal value is taken as uh, a, another field name, right? And that would be impractical because each time we add another uh, block, we would uh, invalidate the type. We want instead the mapping from hexadecimal uh, values to the example elements. So the goal is to detect all unexpected format deviations, detect the need for program updates in this way, right? Because when we have the good type, then whenever we change this type, we can immediately see from 
any any reasonably uh, advanced compiler from the warnings that certain cases are not handled. Right? So there are exhaustiveness checks uh, in in many compilers or linters. We can use them to make sure that all cases are handled. Uh, then uh, we want a minimal containing set for each type. So if we know that it's always integer, then we only handle the integer. We don't handle the information that should not appear there. Uh, also, we want to preserve uh, the information content. So whenever we have a type uh, from three examples, when we add additional example, we want uh, th three initial examples to still fit the type. right? Uh, we also want to ensure the correct operation. In our case, it's not uh, defined as, for example, subject reduction, but more like representing the JSON type as a strongly uh, typed data structure. Because we assume that after we represent it as strongly typed uh, data structure, then our program uh, is likely to be valid if the functions are complete, total. Also, uh, there is so-called decomposition uh, principle that assures that we go through the type constructors uh, as contravariant uh, functors. Uh, basically, the inference has to be contravariant functors with regards to arguments of the, each type constructor. That makes the operation uh, intuitive. So our framework is based on merge operation we could use the same uh, merge operation for unification, mm -hmm. for anti-unification, like the generalization, but we generalize it to any non-lossy learning uh, because we want to add a possibility of learning ambiguous representations, which is not allowed by a simple anti-unification. We make it a type-like uh, object, we call it the type like object, because uh, additionally, besides the monoidal merge operation, we have a sub monoid that's called beyond. And for, uh, for all purposes, we use very weak representation of beyond that is just sub monoid. That is, after we reach beyond for some reason, we cannot escape. In the case of a unification, based algorithms, the beyond would be an error, basically, right? So the conflict between possible possible values. Since we assure non-lossy operation, if we have multiple errors, we need to remember all of them. For anti-unification, basically the generalization uh, that goes into beyond is the top. From here, we cannot generalize anymore. For non-lossy learning, it will be similar to anti-unification in our case. We do not require idempotence and commutativity of match operation. I will give example of how it works uh, later on, but a simple example is additionally besides the, the type, uh, the union type, we may want to add the count of a number of uh, examples that support each union type and hold two different possible representations as union types. And for each of these representations, we will have separate counts. And this is not important. It's still commutative, but it's not important. But commutativity is also not necessary. So we can express the laws for this type like. Uh, for infer and check operation without uh, additional constraint or commutativity. In particular, we have basically an infer operation for from each value, from each example, and a checking uh, a operation that needs to satisfy this law. So basically, when we check uh, at, with a type of that contains no information about presence of any example, we should always get false. It should never try type check, right? If it's within the beyond, we should always get true because beyond cannot be any more generalized. So it should contain the whole realm of possible values. 
then we have monotonicity uh, rules that basically tell that whenever uh, we check the matched type, the original types should be contained. The type has to be checked with the type inferred uh, value should type check with the type inferred from its own and associativity and neutral neutrality there that are common to monoliths. If somebody wants to describe it as a categorical diagram, here is the diagram. Uh, basically, it it tells the same thing as the laws, laws uh, the previous slide. Are there any questions about the laws or or the diagram? I don't see any. No, no slides at the moment. I mean, no questions at the moment. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. So we go further. So now we try to make a simplest possible constraint that satisfies these rules. And that's basically a constraint that doesn't require, that doesn't tell what is inside the type, just checks whether we have any example that supports that the value is present, right? Or we don't, and then we say the value was absent. We have no observations here, and thus the type should reject all possible values because it should never appear there, right? Uh, this is simplification, but it will be used later on uh, to modularly construct a union type uh, for, for, for more complex values. So we have a presence and absence, and we can uh, uh, describe the, the merge operation here that basically absence doesn't add any information, it keeps A. Presence uh, is, is always keeps presence. And of course, there, there should be added rules that are already described in the laws before. And the check should just check that the, the value was present, so it is expected to actually appear. And, and they also what is what could be used what it could be used for is uh, in case we have a an array of of values we can check that the array that is empty has has no no value present it, that is, it has absent value type right so we know it there should be an array there but we don't really know what kind of objects should be inside Uh, next example is that of number constraints. Uh, we would normally use a little bit more uh, of, of constraints like range constraints between 10 and 100, for example. But the, the simplest way to talk about numbers is that they are either ints, integers, or floats, or any other types, which means basically a number with the, with the comma in JavaScript, because it can be arbitrarily large when you enter it, or we don't observe any number. So we, we need to, to always keep this uh, absence and presence constraints in, in, the, in the type. And this allows us to build like a type systems for just, just numbers, constraints on numbers, constraints on booleans, which, which are basically presence and absence constraints. So we know that boolean can exist here or cannot, right? And uh, in case uh, we have a more complex type, we may also want to compute cost of optionality, which is basically cost of how complex is the type. The more union operators we see, uh, the more complicated is the type. And we will it's just search the, the representation that seems simplest. The uh, cost operator is used after the inference is finished. So it's just a way of choosing when we have multiple options after the inference is finished. So when we have a mapping constraint, for example, we would have a key constraint that is some kind of string constraint uh, that would probably include uh, only strings that are emails or only strings that are uh, dates or arbitrary strings, right? 
are only strings that are hexadecimal values and arbitrary strings. And the value that can be any, any JSON value. Then uh, after we define uh, merging basically uh, by merge on, on, on key constraint and merge on value constraint, we can also make a record constraint for the same uh, data type. So whenever we have an object in or dictionary in the JSON, we will use either mapping constraint or record constraint. That worked in different ways. So map mapping assumes that it's mapping from keys to values, and there is only one uh, type for a key and only one type for value. And the record assumes that each name is a field name and they are like unique labels for different types. Then after we define both records and mapping constraints, we can define the, the constraint on the object as basically uh, the, the, the union type that leaves these options open. So it both uh, infers the record constraint and, and the uh, mapping constraint, right? So we have this, uh, this, this uh, reasoning visible here that basically object constraint either never seen an object or if it's seen it tried to fit it in both categories right and at all times both categories either are in beyond which is most generalized type possible or it will be they will be both matching the the all the examples that have seen, been seen so far we do the same for arrays, where basically we have row constraint, which is relation row, and the array case when we have arrays of uh, objects of the same type, which is any union type. And the row constraints in this case are basically rows where we reach our order lists of, of union types. When we already defined the possible uh, constraints for all types of JSON, uh, JSON constructors, we can go into union type. And that's where the presence and absence constraints shine, because that's where they are important. So we basically will consider all cases that were visible by disjoint, uh, disjoint uh, union of all constraints. So we have separate presence or absence constraint for nulls presence of or absence constraint for booleans, a, a number constraint, string constraint, array constraint, and object constraint, right? So we remember all possible examples, sort them by, by constructor, where they fit. And this way we know what are the alternatives uh, to, to match. In the uh, full version of the paper, uh, in the appendix, there is also a translation of how to translate this constraint after inference into the uh, Haskell type that basically chooses uh, the most narrow type, ignores all the uh, absent values, chooses all most narrow type, and uh, then whenever there is ambiguous choice, like for arrays and for objects, then it uses the option with the uh, smallest uh, optionality cost. And uh, after we do this, uh, we may want to add additional representations, maybe more complicated, right? So since the type cost for optionality of union type is easy, easy to define, we just need additional uh, description of what, what kind of learning we can, we can conduct here on union types. I think for any type we can add a counting of the number of examples that support each, each type and each occurrence. Uh, we can, uh, this, this is non-idem potent, of course, so it's no longer a kind of semi-lattice type of subtypes here, uh, or union types here, but it still works within the framework. When we uh, talk about this uh, exposition, we can also uh, do a similar exposition of subtyping for session types. 
and I'm currently working on similar uh, exposition for unification by base type system for uh, basically polymorphic la lambda calculus. Uh, it is convenient as a way of implementation because it's algorithmic type uh, system description and we can test these laws as a quick check uh, uh, properties so that that's easy to conduct in practice uh, it allows us to include any non lossy learning process so it's in a way the framework that allows way more than just anti unification and unification and we can add it modularly only for a certain constructor or for a special case as long as all the other cases also satisfy the, the laws. And in many cases, a generic monoid implementation suffices. And that by generic monoid implementation, I mean something like here. So basically, it's pointwise uh, merge operation on all, all uh, components of the tensor product. So Basically, we, we construct the, the complex union type either by tensor product or by enumerating what happens with beyond and, and uh, empty and uh, information contact explicitly. Uh, we also have this easy extensibility here. So if uh, we want to narrow down, for example, string constraint, we just need to concern ourselves with implementation of string constraints and, for example, add email recognition, right, and, and the special category. And then we check the laws that it's still consistent. And the laws are quite liberal in this way, so they allow a lot of fine tuning. It will be used for next version of JSON Autotype, which is basically a program for inferring the type declarations and parser for JSON types that is producing either Haskell uh, modules, so basically it's type provider for Haskell or Elm or PureScript. So if there are any more questions, maybe? Is there anything uh, maybe unclear? So it looks like we do not at the moment have any questions on the chat. Um, I, I guess I have a question about your use, you sort of making extensive use of type classes and instances yeah. in Haskell. And um, I'm wondering, does that, it, is maybe the gist of it that you're, have you in, is it, can I think of it as encoding the union types in type classes? Is that one way to think about it? So, we we used the type class here to say that uh, we have like general laws that describe the object right mm -hmm. so type classes are to show that all these laws are preserved for all instances right mm -hmm. so it is uh, this way and that means that we could for example define a different instance for any particular type of value like integer but as long as these laws are preserved, we can just replace the type class instance. Okay. This is a um, way of, you know, making this type system more modular. As long as any, all other instances satisfy the, uh, the certain conditions, we can replace any of the instances here, mm -hmm. as, as it would be a different model, right? Mm -hmm. That also allows us to make, write a generic function for testing the loss for any instance, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so I guess my, my next question is, is the, so the main sort of product is this JSON auto type tool. Is, is this uh, tool being used like uh, um, in a company or is that is that something that you've uh, developed and, and it's used? Uh, so it is used in the company for basically product, uh, parsing HTML documentation pages and making implementations of web APIs. But mm -hmm. it is also available as open source. Mm -hmm. 
it is uh, it has a uh, GitHub repository now. Most of development happens in GitLab repository because it has nicer uh, CI. But basically, it's it's the sort open source code that you can add to yourself uh, to your your own project for generating, for example, uh, the, the data types, right? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. I don't see any more questions. So maybe we'll go ahead and conclude. Uh, let's just quickly double check what's coming after this. Uh, I think this is the last talk of this session. Uh, there'll be a joint break for FSCD uh, coming after that. Uh, and then uh, they'll, we'll reconvene for the next session uh, in about about 40 minutes from now, it looks like, if I understand the right time zones. Right, so let's all uh, thank uh, Michael again, and, uh, and uh, we'll see you all later. Thank you very much. If anybody wants to uh, ask anything, I will be available for most of us FCD. And I would love to talk more about implementations of union and intersection types. Very good. Uh, Jeremy, should I close uh, the session or just move to the uh, break room? Sorry, this uh, session this session will continue as a discussion room. So there's no problem. You can stay talking here.